Well, time for calisthenics. Let's stand again. You know, the reason we ask you to stand, at least the reason I do, is just to honor the Word of God. And if you need a Bible and don't have one, the ushers are nearby. If you happen to not own a Bible and are unable to purchase one, we would be happy to give you one as a gift. You can get one in our bookstore. But having your own Bible is just a, uh, a must as far as I'm concerned for a Christian. We're in Luke chapter 14, if you'll turn with me there, please. And a special welcome to you if you're just visiting us this morning, just to clue you in on what we've been doing here Sunday mornings. We've been going through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark. We're now in Luke, and Lord willing, as we finish that, then we'll go into John, and then we'll be in the book of Acts. On Wednesday night, at our midweek service, we started in Romans, and then we did uh, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, and we're now in the book of Philippians. So those are called the epistles or the letters in the New Testament. So here in Luke chapter 14, verse 25, now a great mul- and now great multitudes went with him. And he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, excuse me, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and it is not and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with ten thousand to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you who does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its flavor, How shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill, but men throw it out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Father, we have physical ears. We can hear the rustling of pages. What a beautiful sound that is. We hear the reading of your scripture. We hear perhaps persons next to us making a comment or so. But then, Lord, you've indicated that we have spiritual ears as well. But it's really up to us to turn those on, tune those in. And more than anything, you really want us to hear you. Lord, you know more than we do, that by hearing the Word of God and responding to the Word of God, our faith in you is strengthened and we grow. And that's your desire, Lord, that we would grow, that we would be fruitful. What a blessed God you are. Thank you for the invitation. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. And so, Lord, Open our ears, speak loud and clear. Please make sure, as I'm sure you will, that every person here will have you speak to them very personally this day. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated.
Just a personal note before we get into the message. Uh, folks have been asking me how my brain surgery, I mean my knee surgery went, and um, uh, it's coming along very, very well. I'm healing up well. And as a result of having the knee surgery, I've had to sit rather than stand. And, um, you know, the church has been here well over 36 years. And for probably, oh, I don't know, 25 years or so, I used to sit on a stool. It's only the last number of years that I've preached from a pulpit. And so sitting because of the surgery has reminded me of when I used to sit, I actually like to sit while I'm speaking a whole lot more than I like to stand while I'm speaking. So even though I'm almost better, once I'm completely better, then I'm going to lay down up here, you know. <laughs> but uh, actually, I'm just going to keep sitting. So we were able to get some floor models here for next to nothing at Pier 1. My wife picked them out, and, and uh, what else is new? She knows how to do it better than me. And so I'm just as happy as can be sitting here, and uh, I enjoy it so much. It actually helps me, believe it or not, to think a little, I just feel more comfortable talk, sitting. It helps me to calm my, my mind down and to be able to think a little clearer. And so, and then if I get real excited, I can just jump all around here, but uh, no, I'm just kidding. It says, great multitudes, there in verse 25, went with him. He had been in the home of a Pharisee. A dinner, a feast had been put together. He had been invited. And there was quite a lot of meaningful dialogue that took place while Jesus was in the home of this particular leader. One of the interesting things that was found there in verse 16 through verse 24, and I'll just briefly refer to them, is the story of the master inviting people to the dinner, but then the excuses that were made as to why people didn't come. And I think what Jesus intended by this little story was to remind us there's something called the marriage supper of the Lamb. You can read about it in Revelation chapter 19. We as the church, those who've been born again, are the bride of Christ. He is the bridegroom. And just like when a bride and groom get married, they have a, a beautiful ceremony, they have a supper uh, afterwards, a dinner and so on. Well, when we get to heaven, there's going to be the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's his supper. Interesting, he's actually going to serve us. It seems odd that he would be the one serving us. But remember, he's the bridegroom. And it's the bridegroom's job and function to serve his bride, just as those of us who are married it's our primary responsibility to place our wife above our needs and to make sure that day by day we're focusing on what does she need, how can we help her, what can I do to make her life better. And that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ wants to do in your life. You are his bride. And he didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. So this little story, and I can't, we don't have the time to go over it, but what happened was people knew that the supper was taking place. They would be told way in advance that it was taking place. But then as everything was prepared, the messengers would go back out and say, okay, it's all ready now, time to come. And so when that time came for the messenger to go back out, he went out, but lo and behold, he ran into three different excuses as to why they couldn't come. And you know that today, Jesus is inviting people to his supper, but oddly enough, people have excuses as to why they can't really come. 
The first guy said, you know, I've bought some property and I have to go see it. So you might say that commerce kept him from responding to the invitation uh, given to him. And we see that today where people just, they're so busy with commerce that they don't have time for Christ. They don't respond to the most thrilling invitation of all. The second excuse was a fellow who had purchased 10 oxen. And he said, I have to go test them and work with them. So you might say it was his job. He was just so busy at his job that he just didn't have the time to respond to Jesus Christ. The third fellow, he said, I've just gotten married. And so you might say that his family kept him from responding. So commerce, materialism, the busyness of your work, your family, those are all real parts of life. There's nothing wrong with any of those parts of life. That's the way life is. Those are the things that make up life. But they need not and ought not to be an excuse for not responding to the invitation of Christ. And yet people do. It would be better if they just said, no, I don't want to go. That'd be more honest. But to, to kind of make an excuse, well, you know, I'm too busy. And the thing is, people can get themselves too busy with so many things that there literally is no time for Jesus Christ. So if commerce has gotten you too busy, your job has gotten you too busy for Jesus, or your family has gotten you too busy for Jesus, this is a good time for some spiritual time management between you and Jesus, and he can help you. You sit down with your spouse, and you say, how can we honor the Lord whom we were created for? We were created for his honor, his glory. He deserves everything we have. Who has done for us what Christ has done for us. Who deserves that place of prominence but Jesus? So let's rearrange our lives so that we're becoming what he wants us to become. My pastor, Chuck Smith, who's celebrating in October 3rd, having been in heaven for one year, used to say this, and I, uh, you know, as with anything, you hear things and you believe them, and, and then over time you start to experience the truthfulness of them but he often would say when the church and you could apply this to an individual when the church becomes what God intends for the church to become then God can do for the church what he intends to do you see churches can become lots of things that maybe God didn't intend for them to become Individuals can go in directions that maybe God didn't intend for you to go in. And when we go in those directions, then God is unable to do for us what he wants to do for us. And, you know, the Lord wants to do, he wants to work in us that which is well-pleasing in his sight. He's the God of all grace. He has an affection for you. And the whole concept of not my will, but your will be done. That's merely God saying, listen, line yourself up with me so that I can do for you. It's my Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And of course, the roadmap for how we get lined up, the, the priority checklist, the, the instruction, the power, the, the wisdom, the guidance for how we do all of that is found right here. It's not found in an instant. It's not found in a moment. It's not found at one service, but it's found by abiding in the word, being faithful in your walk with Jesus Christ, letting him teach you, letting him minister to you. And you know what will happen if your heart is open? Like he said, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. He will fill you with the grace of, and the knowledge of God. And he will bless your soul with the peace of God, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. He will mend your soul. He will keep you from going over the edge. He will prohibit you and restrict you from destroying yourself. 
and he'll guide you into the paths of righteousness. So I want to encourage you. Don't be an excuse maker. Somebody once said a person who is good at making excuses, I think it was Benjamin Franklin, a person who is good at making excuses is pretty much good for nothing. I'm trying to let that settle in there, but uh, I think that's very true. So let's be people who appreciate the invitation from Christ and understand that his thoughts towards us are not evil but good and not be making excuses. So anyways, they left the dinner. They left all the excuse makers. And then in verse 25, it says, Now great multitudes, multitudes went with him. We don't know if it was 500, 1,000, 5,000, 10,000. Any number of those are even greater. Everywhere Jesus went, there were multitudes that followed him. And he turned to them. So he's now speaking to this great multitude. And what he does is he explains what the requirements are for discipleship. He's not laying out what the plan or the the way of salvation is, but the requirements, the conditions, the terms for discipleship. You know, salvation is a free gift of God that you receive by faith. We're saved by grace. It's not of ourselves. It's by the grace of God. And we merely turn to God. We receive Jesus Christ into our life and we are saved. Now, once you become saved, then Jesus extends an invitation to you to become a follower of his or a disciple. And the word disciple means to be a learner. I like what Greg Laurie said many years ago. It caught my attention, and I've heard him say it many times, and I've thought about it probably a hundred times over the years. Every person who is a disciple, a follower, a real follower of Christ, is a Christian. You can't be a follower of Christ unless you're first born again. But not all born-again Christians are followers of Jesus. All disciples are Christians, but not all Christians are disciples. I would add there that if you're a Christian but not a disciple, there's no condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. So if you're not really following Jesus the way he's laid out here, you don't need to feel like you're a second-class citizen. He's not pointing his finger at you, wagging his finger at you. I am, but he's not. But it's him that's important. But he is inviting you to follow him. And he's inviting you to learn. Now, you could ask yourself, well, what does he want me to learn? Well, we could prioritize those, and I'm not going to go through the list, but gosh, you could name a whole bunch of things that he wants you to learn. I mean, he said, teach them everything I've taught you, so that covers a lot. But you know the main thing that he wants you to learn? He wants you to learn how much he loves you. He wants you to learn that. Isn't that beautiful? He wants you to learn how much he loves you. Now, the Bible says we love him to begin with because he first loved us. He demonstrated his love for us. Romans 5, 8 says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So he's already proved his love for us. And we love him because of what he's done for us. So, there's a response in the heart of the person who begins to understand how much he loves us. It just does something to us. And, and by the way, 
we will never learn the totality of how much he loves us. He'll be revealing it to us for all eternity. There's no end to it. This beautiful song, like the ocean and mercy and so on, is just a beautiful picture. So Jesus wants you to learn how much he loves you. So, but for you to learn that, you have to go along the prescribed way that he has for you. And it's been said this way also. You can have as much of God as you want. It's really up to you. It's entirely up to you. So here's what he begins to lay it out. And as you notice, just before we get into the detail of this, a three-hour study, before we get into the detail of it, a couple times he said, you cannot. Unless you do this, you cannot be my disciple. The closer he got to the cross, and he was on his way to the cross, he knew that these crowds were following him mostly for the food. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you're hungry and he's got food, let's go get some food. He knew that mostly they were following him for the healings, the miracles. Who can blame them? If you're sick, you need healing. Wouldn't you go? I would. Not many of them really wanted to hear what he had to say. That's why he regularly said, if you have ears to hear, please listen to what I'm saying. So just like today, just like then, today, a lot of people, they come to church, they involve themselves in Christianity for what they can get. They're not really listening to what their Lord or what their Savior is actually saying to them and inviting them to. But if you have ears to hear, you can hear. The other thing that we're going to see is uh, that as he got closer to the cross, his message became much... He, he really laid it out very clearly. He didn't candy coat it. In other words, he didn't say, you know, following me is going to be like going to Disneyland. He laid it out. He said, it's going to cost you something to follow me, and, but the benefits of it, the blessings of actually following Jesus, you, you wouldn't be able to find those anywhere in life. And so I personally... For what it's worth, and I know that my own prayer, just like yours, to God is heard, I personally pray that today the Lord will really make this very clear to you and that today could be the day that a real change begins in your life. So he's speaking to the multitudes and he says this, if anyone comes to me or wants to follow me, and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, that sounds horrible. If you don't hate, that just sounds horrible. But the concept of hate in that culture did not involve intense feelings of loathing or revulsion as modern Western concept does. When we use the word hate, we go, wow, that's a nasty word. It didn't mean that. What it meant was to place something in a lower position than something else. So what Jesus is saying is unless you're willing to put your family and even yourself lower than me, or unless you're willing to put me first above everybody, you cannot be my disciple. You can't really learn of me. Now, you know, when you just stop and think about that, it really makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, you can't be double-minded. You've got to have a focus. So, 
the first requirement is to place everybody, including yourself, below him and to put him above everybody else. That's the first requirement. The second one is listed for us in verse 27. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. There you have it again. Cannot be my disciple. So we have to bear our cross. Now, as was mentioned here by Tim a few moments ago, the cross was a symbol of death. Uh, living in that culture, you would see people crucified. They'd put their crimes, they'd write them down, and it was a deterrent factor. If you do what they did, you're going to be where they are. They wanted the public to know it was one of the ways the Roman Empire kept the citizenry under lock and key. They'd kill you if you got out of line. So the cross meant death. When Jesus said, unless you're willing to pick up your cross, you cannot be my disciple, he clearly didn't mean that you have to die, but what he meant was that you have to die to your own will. And again, that makes perfect sense. How can I follow him if I place my will above his will? I have to say, not only are you more important to me than anybody else, but your will is more important to me than my will. And this verse, as we mentioned last week, is one of the most often mispreached and taught verses in the Bible. And it's meant well, but it's just wrong. People say, you know, I've, got, I've had this arthritis for 20 years, or I work in this terrible job, or I've got all these problems, and I guess that's just my cross to bear. We go, oh yeah, that's your cross to bear. You know, we, we think of it, that's how we use it. Well, I'm bearing my cross, you know, I'm putting up with it. But that's not what it means. Cross meant death. So you cannot follow Jesus, those are his words, not mine. You cannot follow him unless you are willing to die to your will. Then what he does is he says, look, I really want you to consider all of this. Don't just jump into this. Don't make a shallow emotional commitment. Really count the cost. And he said, uh, what man who is going to go out and build a tower doesn't first count the cost, lest after beginning his construction project and then running out of money, uh, finds himself unable to finish it, and, you know, people mock him for his lack of clear preparation. What kind of tower is he talking about? Well, in that culture, even today, agriculturally speaking, and that was the main industry, when you had a piece of property, you would build a tower usually on the corner of the, of the property, one of the corners. And that tower would serve as your living quarters, and it would serve as a vantage point for you to see what was going on, and you would, it would be a place of refuge, protection, and defense, because you'd be able to go up in your tower and see what was happening because there were always thieves coming and stealing your crops and stealing your animals and so on. So he said, a guy that's going to build a tower has to really think about it. Then he uses another illustration where he said, what king going out to war doesn't first consider, you know, what are our military resources? We've got 10,000 troops. The enemy's got 20,000. It might be more sensible for us to go and make a peace treaty. He really thought it through. And he's encouraging you to really think about and consider what the requirements are to follow him. Put him first above everybody, including yourself. Put his will Above your will, you are willing to say no to your will. You know, we're not robots. 
We have a will. And we can either bow up against God, we can be stubborn and argue and fight and think we're smarter than Him. I know, I've, I've done all of that. Or we can say, Lord, not my will be done but yours. Now before we look at the third requirement here, let me say this. Have you ever met a real disciple of Jesus Christ who is sorry that they are following Jesus? Have you ever met anybody who said, you know, this, I considered the whole thing, I prayed about it, I really studied up on this, I, I looked it over, gave it a lot of thought, and put my whole heart into it. Worst decision I've ever made in my life. You ever met anybody like that? I've not. I've met tons of people. I know many people who are disciples. Who are thrilled beyond their wildest expectations to have embraced the invitation of Christ. And it only gets better and better and better as the years go by. Oh yes, the trials, they're there, they're there, they're there. No question about that. But the blessings of God, I mean, listen. Who better to follow than your Creator? Who better to follow than your Father? Who better to follow than the shepherd, the good shepherd of your souls? I mean, is it better for you to follow your own way? To love yourself more than anybody else? To place your will above God? Do you do better that way? Of course not. So you have to then kind of stop and think, Okay, well, if all that's true, if you're following this, if all that's true, then why is it that many people really are not following Jesus? They're just Christians. I guess when you come down to it, they just don't want to. I think that would be the real reason. I just don't want to do it. You think that's a fair answer? Well, if that's the case, I'm leaving them. No, I mean. So here's the third requirement. It's found in verse 33. This one is a zinger. But hold your horses. He says, So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. There's that cannot again. Jesus was like a ven... Not a ventriloquist, but he was just caught up. He can't be this. You cannot do it. He just kept laying it out. He thinned the crowds out, by the way. He wasn't preaching an easy gospel. He wasn't saying what so many today say. Hey, accept Jesus and all your problems will be gone. You know, there's, there's truth in that statement, but there's more untruth than there is truth. Whoever of you, speaking to this large crowd, so we could say, whoever of you here in this room does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Now, let me tell you what this does not mean before I tell you what it means. Because on the surface, it sounds kind of like that hate one up there a little bit ago. He isn't saying you have to get rid of everything you've got. I mean, that makes absolutely no sense. If I took everything I had and gave it to Jim, and he took everything he had and gave it to me, I mean, what's, we're just exchanging property here. It makes no sense. In fact, there's nothing wrong with possessing things. First Timothy chapter 6 says, God has given us richly 
all things to enjoy. So if God has blessed you with things, he wants you to enjoy them. You shouldn't say, oh, I just hate this nice new car smell that I've got. It's just terrible. <laughs> I don't like the new house that I've got in the new couch. It's old. I'm so sorry, Lord. That's not what he's talking about. The word translated forsake means to give up or renounce, to abandon one's right or ownership. It does not imply selling all of one's possessions or giving everything away, but becoming a steward who uses those resources in the service of his master. That's what it means. If you want to be a disciple, you cannot, unless you're willing to relinquish your ownership of everything you have and place yourself merely as the manager of everything you have and follow God's direction for your life. You say, well, that, <laughs> that might mean... Well, wait a minute, that could mean that God might say, I want you to leave that and do something with it for me. That's exactly what it means. There's nothing wrong with owning things. What's wrong is if things own you. Then he can't have his way with you because... The things own you. You know, I used to have an old Volkswagen. It was about a 65 or a 66. It was beautiful. I got it restored. Some of you may remember it. Stupid me. I had to sell it for some reason or other. And then the person who bought it buggered it all up. I hate to say they put stuff on it. And I see it around town. I just say, shame on you. No. I don't do that. But I loved that car. And you know, I used to park it in my garage. And in my garage, I had then, and there still is a room, which was my office. And I used to open the door of my office so I could see my car. And one day, the Lord just very nicely, you know, over a period of time, he just kind of started talking to me. You really love that car a lot, don't you? Yep. And he said, well, you need to work on that. You know, that's, that's kind of getting, it's kind of taking an over space in your heart here. I just said, what, what? I'm having trouble hearing. <laughs> <laughs> I've had it happen to me with golf. You say, now, preacher, you're really messing around here. Stop it. Your hobby, nothing wrong with your hobby. Your exercise program, nothing wrong with it. Anything can take the place of God in your life. God has placed you, wants to place you as a steward. Do you know what bondage there is when you are holding on to things? You're saying, you know, this kind of teaching is bothering me. Well, it, it does. It gets right down to it. But do you know what freedom there is in saying, Lord, whatever you want to do? I like what Queen Esther said. She said, if I perish, I perish. No problem. That's freedom. Paul said the same thing. He said, they were telling him, Paul, you're going to get in all kinds of trouble if you keep up this preaching and, you know, you're going to get in jail and blah, 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 and, or so on and so forth. As Walter has corrected me, he said, don't say blah, blah, blah when you're talking about the Bible. So, Walter, you're in England. I hope you heard me. You know, Walter thinks he's God. Did you know that? <laughs> I can say that. He's not here. And I can tell you this. He's, he's pretty nice, too. He's like God. He's pretty nice. 
But Paul said, you know, none of the things that you're talking to me about, he said, they don't move me. And then, he's, and then here was the key. He said, neither do I count my own life dear unto myself. He said, what I'm really into is that I might finish my ministry with joy. He really had the perspective. He said, I don't care if I die. He said, I, he said even if it demands my life, I'm, I'm still full, fully engaged. The great apostle Paul, and it did. They took his head off at the end. Just like our Lord. So these are the requirements. Now, let me just say this. If you are not a disciple of Jesus Christ, where do you begin to begin becoming one? Well, start asking God to change your life. That's all. Just say, Lord, I'm, I'm listening to you. I can't deny what you're saying here. And down deep inside, you know, I, I really want to go that way. But I'm, I'm not there. I'm only even a little bit moving in that direction, but I... To be honest, I really would like to go that way. Would you please change my life? I, I open my heart to you. I give you permission to change my life. And do you know what God will do? He's going to say, oh, I'm so pleased. It's my good pleasure to give you all that I have. I want to bless your life. I want you to be blessed. And you're, you're now letting me lead you and you're willing to go in the right direction. You see, it's really up to you. Now, there's a last little thing that he talks about here in verse 14, uh, 34. He says, salt is good. But if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor the dunghill, but men throw it out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So this is an interesting little statement he makes about salt. He says, salt is good. And it is, isn't it? Salt in that culture had three or so uh, purposes. One of them, because of the antiseptic quality of salt and the lack of refrigeration, it was used to preserve meat. When they would cook meat, the uncooked portions, they would salt to preserve it from deterioration and decay and disease. It would it would prevent that. So salt in that culture was a preservative. But salt in that culture also was different than the salt we use. The salt then could lose its, its ability very easily. And so he says, salt is good, but if it's lost its flavor, if it loses its ability, it's really good for nothing. And what they would do is they would just throw it out and it would kill the vegetation and it would make clear pathways for them to walk on. So one of the purposes of salt was preserving. The second was to add flavor. Like try eating mashed potatoes without salt. Try eating oatmeal without salt in it. Not good. Once, once my kids, you're saying, what? Oh, yeah, listen. You mean you eat your oatmeal without salt? You, you put the salt in before you even put the oatmeal in while the water is boiling. Let's have a cooking class. <laughs> but because of time, I'm going to forego a story I was going to tell you. Salt, it, it adds flavor to things, doesn't it? There's a third thing that salt does. It produces thirst. It makes you thirsty. 
Now, Jesus said, you are the light of the world, didn't he? He also said, you are the salt of what? So he was saying to Christians, you have a preserving influence. You have the, in, the ability to bring flavor to life. You can create a thirst for Jesus Christ in the lives of people. When we look around at our society, and if we're complaining about its deterioration, perhaps the best place to look would be how well is the preserving influence doing? Are we doing our job? Because at the bottom line is, it's a spiritual issue, it's a hard issue about how people act and the way they are. Maybe the church needs to think about what are we doing or not doing. Because we are that preserving influence. We have Jesus Christ in our lives. And we ought to be bringing flavor to life. Life is, is so flavored the wrong way. If you're a healthy Christian, you're going to bring love, joy, peace into people's lives. And we ought to be creating a thirst. I had someone just the other day tell me, you know, I can see what several members of my family have, I don't have it, and I want what they have. And I said to this person, I said, well, the good news is, you can have it. You can have what they have. Your life ought to create a thirst. When people see you, they ought to say, you know, I don't know what it is about that person, but but I, I don't have what, whatever it is, I don't have it. I'd like to have it. You see, salt is no good if it's lost its flavor. Disciples who do not exhibit the traits Jesus described earlier are not really disciples at all. They have lost their ability to preserve the way salt preserves. Salt preserves what is wholesome and good. Usually salt and ungodly disciples are equally useless. An ungodly disciple is really useless. This is part of what's going to happen at the Bema Seat. Our works are going to be tested, and the ones that are good will be rewarded, and the ones that are useless won't be rewarded at all. Every journey begins with a, um, a step, doesn't it? Jesus even said, if you can hear me, I want you to listen. Are you listening to Jesus? What, are, what is your own mind telling you? What is God saying to you? How is he directing you? Do you know my wife and I, I know you always like it when I close this, because you know it means I'm picking these up, but this is, these are smaller than this, so that helps. But may I just say this, that, you know, my wife and I would not trade what God has done in our lives personally and in our marriage. You could offer me hundreds, of, you could offer us hundreds of millions of dollars. What we would say to you is pay the church mortgage off, but keep your money. We, wouldn't, we would not at all trade what God has done in our lives 
for all the tea in China, as they say. And do you know, um, we, my wife and I feel like we're just learning some basic things about the ways of the Lord. Oh, trials will come. That's inevitable. We just want to encourage you. You listen to Jesus. Consider what it means to follow him. Don't make a shallow commitment to him. If you're interested in the discipleship classes that I'm conducting right now, uh, Tuesday morning at 7 o'clock, there will be one in the cafe. We'll be in lesson number three, I believe. If you've missed the first two and you just would like to join us, just get a booklet and do lesson number three. Join us. Tuesday night over at Starbucks at 6 o'clock, we'll be doing lesson number three. You're very welcome to join us. Thursday night, the first and third Tuesdays and Thursdays, we do these things. Thursday night is our school of ministry. It's open to women and men. If you want to be a deacon, and pretty soon here we're going to be defining what a deacon is, a deaconess, elders, pastors, teachers, uh, we want to encourage you to let those gifts grow in your life. This afternoon, we're completing what has been a um, 12 chapter, 12 lessons, I can't believe it, it's gone by so quickly, and we're completing the last lesson tonight, and it's slaying the giant of jealousy. I want to just read something to you, it'll take me about two minutes. Interesting, jealousy has two sides, a positive and a negative. When we are jealous for another, we have their best interests at heart. When we're jealous of another, we're embarking on a selfish journey that can only end in travail. Self-centered jealousy is a sin to be avoided. An ancient Greek legend sets the stage for our final lesson tonight in which we confront and learn to defeat the giant of jealousy. It seems a young Greek athlete ran in a race and placed second. In honor of the winner, his village erected a large statue in the town square. Envy and jealousy attacked the runner who came in second to the degree that he made plans to destroy the statue. Each night, under cover of darkness, he went out and chipped away at the foundation of the statue, expecting it to fall on its own someday. One night, however, he chipped too much. The statue's weakened base began to crack until it popped. The huge marble statue came down upon the disgruntled athlete. He died under the crushing weight of the one he had come to hate. The truth is, he died long before the statue fell on him. In giving up his heart to envy and jealousy, he had ceased to live for himself. He became a slave to the giant of jealousy. His heart had become a picture of the Greek word envy, which means to boil within. Shakespeare called jealousy the green sickness. To be jealous means to strike out at what somebody else is or what somebody else has. Whereas scripture says that we are to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep, the jealous person does the opposite. He rejoices when others weep, and he weeps when others rejoice. Another's setback is his opportunity for advancement. Another's sorrow, his chance to gain the ascendancy. When the person of whom he is jealous is successful, he turns green with envy. When that person experiences failure, he flushes with the chance to make up lost ground. Jealousy can eat away at one's insides 
as Proverbs suggests in chapter 14, verse 30. And then finally, two sentences here. No giant is more destructive to self and to relationships than the giant of jealousy and envy. To close our study without conquering this giant would leave one vulnerable. Why leave alive the one giant that can erode the peace and joy gained by conquering all the others? That's at 4 o'clock tonight till about 5.30 in the cafe. And you're sure welcome to join us for that. So um, don't tell Walter anything I said about him when he gets back, okay? You promise? Okay, let's pray, please, for the offering, the tithes and the offerings. And would, would you please join me in thanking our worship team for their <laughs> ministry? I think they've picked out a beautiful song to end our service with that's so familiar. And would you guys turn around and look at all those people up in that? Uh, if they put one more person up there, the whole thing is going to come down. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the Bible, the Word of God. It's just so wonderful. It teaches us. It cuts right to our lives. And it... It incites within us a hunger for you. You're so gracious. Your arms are open. And your heart is willing to receive us. And Lord, as we bring your tithes and offerings, we also bring our hearts and we give them to you. Make us disciples. We, we really would like to be disciples in Jesus' name.